Brian Welker couldn't help but smile as he wiped the sweat from his forehead. Earlier that day, he was promoted to shift supervisor at Harding Containers, effective immediately. Working the night shift for the foreseeable future was the icing on the cake. Most people hated the night shift, but for Brian, it was a great time. His son was a junior in high school. He participated in several sports and clubs. By working nights, Brian could attend his son's classes without missing work. Over the years, he worked the night shift more than once and developed a napping system that allowed him to do it all. It was for this reason that he crawled along the rafters of the roof in his attic on a warm August day. After he was informed of his promotion, he was given paid leave on Thursday and Friday. It was an opportunity to rest and prepare for his new position, which begins Sunday evening. Brian had long planned to build a small apartment over his detached garage. This would become his fortress of solitude, where he could sleep peacefully all day long. He hoped to avoid the usual disturbances and distractions that so often arise when trying to sleep at a time when most people are already up. Brian was laying cable so he could have internet in his apartment. The Wi-Fi signal in the house simply did not reach the apartment. He decided to place an extension cord at the end of his home's attic, closest to the garage, in the hopes that it would give a strong signal inside his apartment. While Brian was working on unwinding the cable along the entire length of the attic, he heard faint sounds coming from inside his home. It was early afternoon, so his wife Brenda must have been at work. Tim, their son, was visiting Brenda's parents for a few days, so the house had to be empty. Brian crawled through the farms to the place where the sounds were coming from. Having come five meters closer, Brian was able to determine the source of the sounds. This was his bedroom. The conversation became much clearer as Brian perched himself above the unused air conditioning vent in his bedroom ceiling. Brenda insisted that the old vent blew cold air on her at night, causing her to experience frequent neck pain. He installed the new vent as far away from Brenda's bed as possible, but never got around to sealing the old one. This would require sealing the hole in the ceiling that was created when the vent duct was pulled out. Brian just left it on the ceiling but didn't attach it to any duct work. He carefully lifted the fiberglass insulation that lay on the attic floor and slowly opened the vent. Everything sank inside him when he saw his wife with a thin man. As painful as the vision was, Brian couldn't look away. He couldn't stop watching the train wreck that was once his marriage. The couple had been having sex for several minutes when Brian's brain finally began to function. He set his phone to record video and carefully placed it on the vent so that the camera's eye had an unobstructed view of his marital bed. I like the way you are, the guy purred. Your husband never touches you? I asked you not to mention Brian, Brenda protested, somewhat weakly in Brian's opinion. It's not about him. He is a good lover and a great father. I'm sure it is. We have sex right here in his bed, but you insist that you like the way he does it. What's wrong with this situation? I don't know why I let you talk me into doing this here. Right here. You don't have the slightest chance of being caught in your apartment. Brenda moaned. The couple stood still for a minute before Brian saw the man roll off his wife. Do you see how powerful it is when you take risks? Asked Brenda's lover. Having sex in my apartment is great most of the time, but doing it in your marital bed is another level. Brian recognized the man enjoying his wife as soon as he rolled over onto his back. It was Bill Grant, a driver for the package delivery company where he and Brenda worked. He was recently divorced and had a daughter in Tim's class. That sounds terrible, Brenda replied, but without any real emotion. You wanted to have sex in my bed, because the thought of outplaying Brian turns you on? You act like it's a competition. It's a competition, at least for men, Grant replied with a soft chuckle. You're a sexy woman and the sex is great, but knowing that you're married and I'm having sex with you in your husband's bed makes me a winner. This is an incredible feeling. It wouldn't be so great if Brian caught us here. I don't know why I agreed to this, but it won't happen again. I'm worried that Brian will find us. It would ruin my marriage, Brenda admitted. Let's make a deal. 
Grant suggested. As long as you don't have sex with your husband, I won't insist that we do it in his bed. Once he has you again, we will have to return so that I can reclaim my place as leader. I'm not going to refuse Brian. He's my husband, Brenda reasoned. He is a man and wants sex on a regular basis. I'll try to dissuade Brian from having sex and keep these suicide meetings in my bedroom to a minimum. I don't like to think about what would happen if Brian ever caught us. Brian parked his truck in a detached garage. It was hidden from prying eyes, so Brenda had no idea he was home, and she certainly had no idea he was Evis dropping on her conversation. His face was covered with sweat. It continuously flowed from his body onto the insulation that covered the attic floor. He forced himself to remain still as he listened to the loving couple dress and leave. As Brian headed towards the stairs, he considered what he had just learned. His wife is cheating on him. She even planned to abstain from sex with him, if possible, in order to appease and please her lover. Thinking this over, Brian forced a grim smile. Brenda will have no problem refusing sex with him because she will never have it again. While taking a shower, he examined his situation and quickly came to several solutions. He didn't let Brenda know that he knew about her infidelity. Tim had two years of high school left, so Brian decided his main focus would be his son. He won't worry about Brenda anymore. He just didn't care what she wanted or how she felt anymore. Why should he care about her when she obviously treated him with complete contempt? He didn't want to leave the house he'd spent 15 years renovating so that some sneaky idiot could live there in comfort while having fun with his wife. Brenda didn't sound like she would seek a divorce, so Brian decided to try to hold out until Tim graduated from high school. He knew there was one thing he would need. His apartment will be completed much earlier. Brian decided he would include some major improvements. Instead of just sleeping there while working the night shift, it would become his living quarters for the next year and a half. He will need a small kitchen as well as a full bathroom. By the time Tim graduated from high school and headed off to college, Brian would have had time to make a plan for what to do next. To this end, Brian called several contractors he knew and made an appointment to get an estimate. He decided to hire a company to complete the job. It would be done quickly and professionally, and he would pay someone to do it. There was no longer any need to save pennies by doing everything yourself. His promotion would easily allow him to cover the costs. For the first time in his life, Brian realized that his time was more important than money. If he saved a dollar, half would go to Brenda. He ended his old way of life. He always tried to do as much housework as possible, thinking that it would benefit his family. Everything changed when he saw that it wasn't betrayal. He was going to make sure Tim's college education was fully funded. Besides, Brian was going to rebuild his life and have some fun while doing it. He no longer felt any affection for his unfaithful wife. Brian had gotten over his emotions by the time Brenda walked in after work and saw him sitting in the kitchen. Are you already at home? Did you leave early for some reason? Brian looked closely at Brenda and decided that she seemed different to him. She had a few wrinkles on her face and had gained a few extra pounds. Why didn't he notice this before? Has his love for his wife blinded him, causing him not to notice her shortcomings? He was sad to think about his sudden change of heart towards Brenda, but it was her decision to have an affair. He simply reacted. Yes, we have a little problem at work, I've been asked to work some nights starting tonight. They let me go home, pack my lunch, and rest. I'll come back later. They shouldn't ask you to work nights after a day shift, even if you had some free time during the day, Brenda reasoned. You'll be exhausted. At least lie down and sleep for a few hours. Good idea, Brian replied. I'll just crawl under the sheets and... Wait, Brenda insisted too loudly, remembering the state of the bed. I just remembered that I need to wash my bed linen. Okay, Brian answered calmly, chuckling darkly to himself at Brenda's discomfort. I'll just use the bed in the guest room. There's no need to worry so much. A few hours later, Brian left the house as if he was going to work. He went to a local sports bar, watched a baseball game, and drank a few beers. Previously, he installed an air mattress in his future apartment. Once he was sure Brenda was asleep... 
He parked in the garage and walked up the stairs to the waiting air mattress. He slept surprisingly well. One of the contractors Brian spoke with the next day was between projects and offered a very good price if Brian agreed to start immediately. In two weeks, the contractor's crew will move to a new construction site a few kilometers away. Brian agreed and signed a contract to begin work on Monday morning. His night shift worked from Sunday evening to Thursday evening. The plant was scheduled to close Friday night and restart Sunday night. Brenda knew Brian wouldn't have to work Friday night, so she was surprised when he got ready for bed the next night and headed to the guest room. Why are you going to sleep in the guest room? We won't see each other much while you're on the night shift, so why don't you sleep in our bed? asked a puzzled Brenda. Since I worked last night and slept a few hours this morning while you were at work, I'm not very tired. I'm going to watch a baseball game and maybe a movie after that, Brian responded with his planned excuse. I'm trying to get used to being awake at night and sleeping in the morning. I don't want to ruin your sleep unless you think we should have sex, Brian suggested, wiggling his eyebrows suggestively. Brenda's reaction was exactly what Brian expected. If he hadn't heard her conversation with her lover, he would have missed her brief deer-in-the-headlights look before she smiled faintly. I am very tired today. Maybe we could just cuddle a little and go to bed, Brenda answered. Besides, Tim is home tonight. He can hear us. Hugs won't help me, Brian answered. As soon as I hold you in my arms, I want to do everything with you my way. If you rule out sex, I'll just remove the temptation and sleep in the spare room. You've never worried about Tim hearing us before, so this is just an excuse to avoid sex. You really don't have to make anything up. I'm not the kind of guy who forces himself on a woman. I know that, Brian. You are right. It was pretty weak, and I'm sorry. I'm just tired and not feeling romantic. I hope you understand. I understand this better than you think. Let me know when you're in the mood. If I'm in the mood at the same time, we could meet. Good night, Brian retorted, turning and heading into the guest room, leaving Brenda with a confused look on her face. On Saturday, Brian played catch with Tim for an hour and then did some yard work. When it was time for bed, he walked down the hall to the guest bedroom. Brenda looked at his back and wondered why he was acting so strangely. Brian went to work early on Sunday evening to prepare for his role as shift supervisor. By the time the production people started showing up, he felt very good about his work situation. He didn't bother to tell Brenda that he had been promoted to foreman. She had secrets that she kept from him, so he no longer had any qualms about keeping things from her. His shift went smoothly. He was well received by those who worked under him. He decided that he had a great group of people on his shift. The new position implied greater responsibility, but Brian had seen all the problems before and knew how to deal with them. He settled into his job with minimal adjustments or difficulties. Brenda had already left for work and the construction crew was doing the installation when Brian returned home Monday morning. He spoke briefly with the foreman to make sure they were on the same page and then went inside. He fell asleep immediately, but was awakened several times by loud noises from the crew working in his apartment, and once by a telephone ringing. Cursing himself for forgetting to turn off the ringer on their landline in the guest room, Brian responded with a sleepy, Hello. I'm sorry, Brian. Did I wake you up? asked his mother-in-law, Beverly. Is that why you called? Brian barked with some irritation. You wanted to know if I was sleeping? No need to show off, Beverly answered. I just wanted you to know that Bill and I heard that you're on the night shift and we won't bother you. If you need us to do anything for Tim while you sleep, just let us know. Brian hung up without answering. As he unplugged his phone, he thought about how stupid people could be. It took a few minutes, but he fell asleep again. The construction crew completed their work in less than a week. Brian was amazed at how the contractor completed the entire renovation in four days. It would take him four months. Waking up on Friday afternoon, he went to a furniture store and ordered a double bed, a small kitchen table, four chairs, and a small sofa. He then drove to a large appliance dealer and selected a large flat-screen TV, refrigerator, oven, and microwave. By Monday afternoon, Brian believes his bachelor pad will be ready for him to work full-time, he chuckled, 
remembering how bewildered Brenda had been when she came home from work on Monday to find a team of men scurrying around the detached garage. She approached Brian while he was talking to the foreman and insisted on a private conversation so that he could tell her what was going on. I instructed them to complete the apartment above the garage, said Brian. I want to be able to sleep all day long without people barging in or calling me. I made it double insulated to keep noise to a minimum. There won't even be a landline phone. Since I'll be working nights for a while, I thought it would be a huge advantage to have a place where I could sleep without disturbing you and Tim. You won't even notice that I'm nearby. I won't notice that you're nearby, Brenda repeated. You are my husband and Tim's father. We need to know that you are somewhere nearby. I'll go to Tim's baseball practices and games. Then I'll bring him home so we can spend a lot of time together. Do not worry about it. We can all have dinner together. I told you a few days ago to let me know when you're in the mood for some special love, but you haven't accepted my offer yet. Are you asking me this tonight? You're acting like an idiot. Husbands are expected to do more than just have sex with their wives whenever they feel like it. We expect conversation, seduction, and the exchange of ideas. Marriage is not just sex. You know that. Don't even think about giving me a lecture about what constitutes a good marriage, Brian warned. I will at any time oppose the efforts I make for this marriage to your efforts. This will work fine. All you have to do is let me know when you want me to serve you in your bed. I'm not some goddamn cow that needs to be serviced, Brenda growled. You will not do any service until you offer a sincere apology. I want to spend a nice evening in a nice restaurant with your apologies, asshole. Brian broke out into a huge smile and simply walked away, leaving Brenda completely confused. It was easy for her to stop Bill Grant from demanding sex with her in their marital bed, but Brenda was worried about Brian's attitude. He just didn't look like himself. He ignored Brenda, and it bothered her. He has always been a very attentive husband. She decided that she would give Brian an unforgettable evening as soon as he apologized for his rude behavior. She knew that he wouldn't be able to go without sex for a long time. A man cannot stop having sex two to three times a week and be happy. Brenda was sure he would want what she had. He had been like this since they first met. He was too young to lose interest in sex. By the following Wednesday, Brian was fully moved into his new apartment. This coming weekend, there will be three days off due to Labor Day. Tim's junior year was supposed to start next Tuesday. How would you two feel about going to the Diamondbacks game this weekend? Brian asked over dinner on Thursday. They're playing the Dodgers and fighting for the pennant. This should be a great game. Seriously? That would be amazing. Thanks, Dad, Tim blurted out. You know I don't really like baseball, Brenda grumbled. I will refuse this offer. I'll find something to do around the house. I bet it will, Brian answered under his breath, but loud enough for Brenda to hear. Everything is settled. Tim and I will go to the game on Saturday. Wow. I can't wait to tell Scooter about this, Tim blurted out. He will be so jealous. He's a big Dodger fan. He previously lived in Los Angeles. Why don't you invite him with you? Brian suggested. Baseball is more fun to watch with friends, especially if they are fans. I'll call him right now. Thank you, Dad. Tim answered excitedly and rushed to get his phone. You definitely made Tim happy, Brenda said. Baseball is a great way to bond with boys. Horace is a pleasant, polite young man. Holy shit. His real name is Horacy, Brian asked shaking his head. No wonder he has a nickname. What parents would name a boy, Horace, unless they hated him. Tim told me that Horace's father died of a brain aneurysm two years ago, Brenda continued, pointedly ignoring her husband's comment about the boy's name. She and her mother moved here this summer to be closer to her parents. They are old and in poor health. I'll just call him Scooter and pretend I've never heard his real name. Brian said just as Tim burst back into the room. Scooter's mom said he can go, declared an almost frivolous Tim. It will be great. On Saturday afternoon, Tim parked his truck in the driveway of a nice ranch in a nice neighborhood. Before he could stop, Scooter was already running out the door. 
He hopped in next to Tim as soon as the pickup was safely parked. Mr. Welker, Mom says she wants to meet you before we leave. I think she wants to make sure you're not a serial killer, Scooter suggested. I'm sorry about that. No problem, Brian answered, getting out of the truck, walking up to the house and ringing the doorbell. The door was opened by a slender, rather plain-looking woman about Brian's age. With what he thought was a quick glance, Brian determined that her legs were her best feature. They were muscular and perfectly shaped. Her jogging shorts gave him a chance to admire them. Her stomach was flat, while her breasts barely moved her top away from her torso. My legs look pretty good compared to the rest of my body, don't you think? Scooter's mom asked, much to Brian's confusion. I, uh, yes, Brian agreed, as soon as he saw the smile on the woman's face. You have a magnificent pair of legs. Do you think I should let my son go to a baseball game with a man who stares at every woman he sees? The boy's mother challenged. I'm trying to raise a gentleman. Brian saw the laughter in the woman's eyes and instinctively knew that she was playing with him. He decided to play along with her. What you're really asking is whether you should let your son go anywhere with a man, since looking at women is the best part of being a man, Brian replied with a grin. He needs to learn to appreciate the fairer sex. I'll show him what to pay attention to and how to do it. I, of course, hope that you will be less noticeable during these life lessons that you will give to Horace, the still-smiling woman objected. The first thing I'll teach him is to beat anyone who calls him Horace, except his moom, of course he. Brian joked. Understand. My son will learn to be cruel to people who call him by his name, and also to appreciate women's legs. Does this explain everything well enough? Not even close, Brian answered. I'll show him the subtle art of secretly assessing butts and breasts. It is important that he receives a comprehensive education and does not become completely fixated on any one piece of female jewelry. This is a big relief, Scooter's mom replied, thereby gaining even more respect from Brian. Have a good time and be sure that Scooter will call if you're going to be late. By the way, my name is Gertrude. Seriously, Gertrude? What do your friends call you? Brian asked. Oh, for my male friends, I answer Minx, Raven, Candy, or Bubbles. My friends call me Gertrude, the woman answered with a calm face. I think it sounds tempting. I'm Brian. We're going to be friends, so I'll call you Minx. I kind of like this name. Why am I not surprised? Gertrude replied before bursting into hearty laughter. Horace can come with you any time. I like your sense of humor. Tim is a very polite young man so I was pretty sure his parents would be okay. Thank you for inviting him to the game. We are a baseball family. I used to go to as many Dodgers home games as I could. My father even played in the minor leagues before I was born. He was pretty good, just not good enough professionally, added Gertrude. Scooter is a great guy, so it's not a problem. I'll keep an eye on him and make sure he gets home safe and sound, Minx. Have a good day. Will this still apply? I was just kidding, Gertrude protested. You will always be a minx to me, came the quick reply as Brian turned and headed back to the truck. Brian had a great day playing. Scooter managed to catch a random ball. Both boys ate too many hot dogs and drank too much soda. They fell asleep in the back of the truck before Brian could even pull out of the parking lot. Arriving at Scooter's house, Brian carefully woke the boy and walked the sleepy teenager to the front door, where he was greeted by a beaming Gertrude. He probably ate too many hot dogs and soda, Brian admitted. Of course he did. He was at the ball game, answered Gertrude. Thank you very much for picking him up and returning him safe and sound. I was very pleased. Scooter is a great guy, Minx, Brian retorted. See you at the boys' games. Brian settled into a routine that worked well for him. He would return home, have a light breakfast, and then sleep from nine to three. Thanks to the extra soundproofing and thick curtains on the windows, he usually slept soundly. Brenda sometimes complained that he always slept in his man cave, even on weekends. She dropped the subject as soon as Brian asked if she needed his services. Brian decided that she was really worried that Grant would insist on sex in her bedroom and she would get caught. 
This suited Brian just fine. This indicated that she had no intention of asking for a divorce at this time. His goal of staying married until Tim graduated from high school seemed achievable. Because he was a foreman and received less physical activity, Brian bought a home exercise machine that was advertised as a complete body workout. To his pleasant surprise, it worked as advertised as long as he was diligent in using it. He attended all of Tim's baseball practices, and soon the coach had him work with a few kids on the sideline as while the coach coached at another group of players. Tim was a pretty good player and was showing signs of improvement. But Scooter was a real surprise to Brian. He showed some talent early in the season but was unsure and timid. Brian worked with him as much as he could. They even spent several hours on weekends training at a local park. Brian decided that since he hadn't had sex, he might as well relieve the tension by playing baseball with the boys. As Scooter's confidence grew, his level of play increased dramatically. By mid-season, Scooter was hitting balls and playing shortstop at a high level. Tim was the starting center fielder and batted third. Brian was extremely proud of both boys' accomplishments. One thing Brian couldn't help but notice was the attention some of the children's mothers were starting to give him. For some reason, his jokes really made them laugh. His efforts with the children were constantly praised. Several mothers would bake something for the team, but they always make sure he gets a piece, no matter what it is. Tim's friendship with Scooter, as well as Brian's time with the boys, naturally led to Gertrude and Brian spending time together. Brian thought of her as a smart friend, with a great sense of humor. He decided to ask Gertrude if she had noticed the increased interest that his mother showed in him. I may be a little crazy, Minx, but I have to ask you a slightly personal question, Brian began. Almost the second size. This was Gertrude's quick answer. What? I didn't ask that, Brian admitted. When men preface a question to a lady by saying it's personal, don't they usually ask her about her breast size? Well, yes. That's usually true, Brian agreed with a chuckle. At this point, I was going to ask if you've noticed that some of the mothers have been treating me differently in the last couple of weeks. Don't you think they seem a little friendlier lately? Well, aren't you Mr. Observation? Gertrude retorted. You don't really know what's going on, do you? I would need more information regarding what you're referring to before I could answer that question, Brian said thoughtfully. I understand the rule of flying in the infield, I know you never win the first or last inning at third base. You don't mean those baseball axioms, do you? No, I was talking about the unwritten rule of never rigging or stealing bases when you have a huge advantage, Gertrude quipped before becoming more serious. If you were paying attention, you would know that the friendliest mothers on the team are also single mothers. You're a great dad, a nice guy, and you have a pretty decent job. This makes you a damn attractive candidate in their eyes. Gertrude reasoned. What about the fact that I'm a married man? Wouldn't they take this into account? Brian asked. It is, answered Scooter's mother. That's why they didn't actually try to seduce you. No one has tried this yet, have they? Nobody seduced me. As if that was ever a problem, Brian replied. I'm married, so obviously I can't be a good match for anyone. Brian, I don't like that it feels like I have to be the one telling you this, but we're friends, so it falls on me. All mothers know that your wife is cheating on you. This is not enough. Rumor has it that she cut you off from sex. You're not sleeping together, and it's obvious that you'll be a free agent in the not-too-distant future. These women want to sign you up for their team as soon as you're discharged. Brian was stunned by Gertrude's revelation. How could so many people know about his personal situation? Who could know about his sex life or lack thereof? And then it dawned on him. Brenda must have told that bastard that we weren't sleeping together and he bragged about it to someone. Do you mean your wife or her lover? Gertrude asked, trying to defuse the situation. I have to say that you don't seem very surprised by the rumors. Have you already suspected Brenda of cheating? No, I never suspected, Brian answered. You had no idea at all? Gertrude asked incredulously. I knew she was cheating. I just never suspected it, Brian replied. Here you amazed me. How could you know this and not suspect? It's quite simple. 
I didn't suspect a damn thing until I found Grant and Brenda in our bed. In a matter of seconds, I went from knowing she was cheating on me to being sure. I completely stopped being suspicious. This revelation raises more questions than it answers, said his confused girlfriend. You saw them do the horizontal mambo, but you stay married and don't go to jail. You're not a pervert, are you? Or a guy who likes to watch? Please don't be one of these scum. But I'm not going to. Don't worry about it, Brian assured. I decided to adjust my priorities. Being able to spend a lot of quality time with Tim and not be a part-time dad became my first goal. Living with Brenda rather than divorcing her seemed like the best way to achieve this. I started working at night, and it always had a negative impact on our sex life. I built a nice apartment over my detached garage and lived there. I told Brenda it was so I could sleep during the day without being pestered and annoyed by everyday crap. She was unhappy with the sleeping conditions. But Grant told her that every time she had sex with me, he would insist on regaining primacy in our marital bed. This seemed to bother her, but not enough to stop her from having fun with him. She thinks her affair is a secret and wants to keep it a secret. I haven't told her, but I won't have sex with her for any reason. I went to the clinic and got tested for sexually transmitted diseases. I am clean. I want it to stay that way. Are you serious? Did you hear that? What a bitch. How can she treat a guy like you so badly? What an idiot this guy is. Gertrude was indignant. All the single mothers think you'd be a great match. I think you may have an inflated opinion of my desirability. I've never been a matinee idole. I have a really good job, so maybe this will help me look better to some of the more desperate women, Brian suggested. Are you joking? Look how beautiful you are. You have a wonderful smile, Gertrude noted. You are strong, kind, smart, and get along well with children. If I weren't so homely and flat-chested, I would have already thrown my hat into the ring along with my bra. I think... I better shut the hell up. Thank you for being a good enough friend to tell me what people are saying and thinking, Brian replied, frowning. I had no idea that everyone knew that I was a cuckold. It's quite awkward. I can't make my own wife happy. I'm a world-class weakling. You are a good person who wants to be a good father to his son. You're strong enough to take this crap, so you can have a great relationship with Tim. Horace thinks you're pretty cool, too. Who? Brian asked. You must feel better if you can tease me with Horace's name, Gertrude remarked with a smile. Minx, you are a great friend. You didn't let me stick my head too far up my ass. I just hope Tim doesn't find out. This horse has either left the stable or is damn close to it, Gertrude said. Horace says Tim knows something is wrong at home. You're pretty much avoiding his mother. He's bound to hear something when so many people know about it. Do you know what worries me? added Gertrude. Scooter is in love with Heather Grant. How awkward is this for him and for me? She's a sweet girl. She has no idea what a pathetic jerk her father is. I'm just glad Tim isn't the one snooping around Heather, Brian said. What a mess that would be. I should be happy for small favors. Scooter told me that Tim is very interested in Holly Ingram, but that shouldn't surprise you too much. She comes to every game and cheers for his every move, said a smiling Gertrude. Yeah. I noticed she was hanging around. She seems like a nice girl. I knew her father and uncles at school, Brian recalled. They are a good family. Two nights later, Tim's team played in the first round of the district championship. Brian realized that as game time approached, he was probably more nervous than Tim. It didn't help that the usual three single mothers were determined to get his attention. Norma Wilson was wearing a top that exposed a significant portion of her ample breasts. She constantly found reasons to lean toward Brian to pick up something or look for something. Brian had to admit that her cleavage was impressive. Brandy Dorn kept her breasts covered, but in a very tight sweater. Her thin waist and flat stomach emphasized the charm of her full, firm breasts. She constantly asked Brian questions about the team and players. Jillian Patterson was less subtle. For some reason, she had to stand close enough to Brian to press her impressive breasts against his arm or side. Gertrude grinned knowingly, handing him a soda and a hot dog before returning to her place on the first base side of the diamond. 
Brian noticed that all three ladies had found some reason to leave his circle all at the same time. It seemed strange to him until he heard a familiar voice behind him. I thought I would join my husband this afternoon to watch my son play. I didn't think I'd have to wade through so many fans to get to him, Brenda said, louder than necessary. What's going on, Brian? The game hasn't been called yet, but Tim looked pretty good in batting practice, Brian replied, trying to dodge the question. Nice try, Brenda snapped. Why did these women hover around you like flies over shit? It's good that you are not allergic to silicone. If you're asking me to explain how the female mind works, then you're out of luck. I have no idea, Brian admitted. I'm even surprised that you're here. My son is participating in an important game. I'm here to support him. Obviously, there are other mothers here. Obviously, some of them are not just here for their children. You were too busy to come to the games, Brian noted. How did you manage to evade your obligations today? Brenda glanced at her husband when he mentioned her obligations. She wondered for a moment if he was hinting at something. As soon as this thought came into her mind, she immediately threw it away. If he had any suspicions, he would be much angrier and much more confrontational. The only thing she knew about Brian was that he would never accept her betrayal. If he had known, he would have let her know it in the most obvious way. I made time. This game is important to Tim which makes it important to me. I haven't seen you much since you left for the night shift, so I thought it would be nice to spend some time together cheering on Tim, Brenda reasoned. As Brenda and Brian sat down in the bleachers, she noticed that several other mothers were watching her, and they didn't seem all that friendly. Brenda thought about it. What could she have done to anger other mothers? This was the first game she attended. She had no other form of interaction with any of them, so she couldn't think of any reason why they would dislike her. Then Brenda noticed Gertrude sitting to the side. As usual, she didn't do much to stand out, although Brenda noted that her hair was professionally styled and her legs looked good in shorts that were perhaps a little short, especially given the cool daytime temperatures. The game began, and Brian's attention was drawn to the playing field. The first two batters struck out before Tim even entered the batter's box. Brenda became concerned for her son when she saw how fast the first serve was and how close it went to his head. The second pitch was low and away from Tim, but he connected solidly and threw the ball to first base for a stand-up double. The next batter was Scooter. Brenda noticed that he seemed older, stronger, and more confident than last summer. The first pitch hit the catcher's glove near Scooter's head. If he hadn't leaned back, she might have hit him. Brenda heard Brian chuckle as Scooter prepared for the next pitch. Trying to intimidate these two boys is a big mistake, Brian said to those within earshot. I just hope the pitcher tries to sneak a fastball to Scooter. The rest of the crowd nodded in agreement as the pitcher began his pitch. He was a strong thrower, and he added something extra on the next pitch. There was a loud crack as Scooter's bat met a baseball crossing the court. Oohs and ahs echoed through the stands as the ball disappeared over the center field fence. Tim ran across the plate and waited for his friend to touch home plate before exchanging high fives. Gertrude beamed with pride as she watched her son circle the bases. She looked at Brian only to see small tears on his cheeks. He spent countless hours practicing on the field and hitting the ball with Tim and her son. His pleasure and pride were almost tangible. Gertrude was extremely grateful to Brian for the mentoring he had provided to her son since their arrival. Horace grew up to be a fine young man, and Brian played a huge role in the development of his character. Are you really trying to tell me that you haven't had sex with your husband since the day we had sex at your house? Asked her incredulous lover. You said I should stay away from him for as long as I could, and you wouldn't insist on sex in our house until he made love to me. He was working the night shift that day and has been sleeping in a room above the garage ever since. We haven't even shaken hands since then. This is just crazy, Bill replied. He's too young and you're too sexy for him to lose interest in sex. He is a gay? Does he have a girlfriend or something? He's definitely not gay, Brenda insisted. He is very courageous. He would never cheat on me. He just works at night and is tired most of the time. He only shows up for dinner, except on weekends when he works in the yard and stuff. 
No normal man married to a woman like you would voluntarily give her up, even if he worked 18 hours a day, Grant said. He must be cheating. This should make communication easier for us. He gets what is his, and I get what used to be his. Brian would never cheat on me, Brenda said firmly. He takes our marriage vows very seriously. He's not the kind of man who wanders around and gets involved in some tawdry affair. Is this what you think you're doing? Bill demanded. Oh no, this is just a temporary phenomenon. He was too busy with work and Tim's baseball game to pay much attention to me. I deserve some fun. I work hard to run the house and cook, and I also work full time, Brenda reasoned. We know that this won't last long. Bill smiled as he considered Brenda's words. I guess you're right. We'll just enjoy the sex while it happens. Give me the day when I can master you in your bed. It still turns me on. When Brenda remembered Bill's words, she became worried as she watched the two girls hovering around, Brian slowly move away. It was obvious that he had some damn attractive women with big tits and toned bodies who were interested. She realized that she needed to protect her marriage from the efforts of these bitches. Then she noticed Gertrude sitting alone on the side. Brenda quickly came up with a plan. She smiled widely and sat down next to the surprised Gertrude. Glad to see you again, Gertrude. Horace has become a pretty good baseball player and is a very sweet boy. You should be proud of him. I'm proud, admitted the wary Gertrude. Tim is doing very well, too. Brian's time with them pays off. He truly was a great mentor to Horace. Yes, sometimes Brian is too good, Brenda replied, seeing an opportunity for her proposal. I'm sure you've noticed how those big-breasted blondes are always hanging around him. I wanted to ask if you could help me. I know Brian would never go astray under normal circumstances, but he's a man, and all these women do is show off their big tits when they're around him. How do you think I should help you? asked Gertrude. Spray them with cold water when they get too close? You know that I cannot attend most games and practices due to my work and other commitments, Brenda began carefully. I know I can trust Brian to you. You're not his type at all. If you would just stick around when I'm not around, I would really appreciate it. I'm going to tell Brian that he needs to stay closer to you and be more attentive. These husband-stealing bitches will think he has his eye on you and hopefully leave him alone. I know it might feel awkward for you to pretend like this, but there's a good reason for it. You could have saved our marriage. Please let me clarify if I understood correctly, answered the incredulous Gertrude. You're worried that these attractive, sexy single mothers might seduce Brian, so you ask me to kind of fill in for you when he's at ball games and practice. Do you think I'm a successful single mother because I don't have big boobs and I'm pretty plain looking? I didn't say you were sad. I just know Brian. For whatever reason, he's less likely to fall in love with you than with some buxom ex-cheerleader. You would help him keep his vows. Do you think your spouse cheating on you is a deal-breaker? Gertrude asked thoughtfully. Would it be so bad if he slept with a few of these willing ladies while you remained his number one? I hope you're joking, Brenda objected. I love my husband, but I will never tolerate cheating. This really is the deal-breaker you mentioned. This destroys the marriage contract. I could never come to terms with infidelity. As far as I'm concerned, the marriage would be over. You must understand how I feel. You have been married for many years. I understand what loyalty and dedication are. It is quite logical that adultery violates the marriage contract, Gertrude admitted. I have to agree. I need to go see Brian. Can I trust that you will keep a close eye on him when I'm not around? Asked Brenda. Oh, yes, Gertrude answered with a smile. Be sure to explain all this to Brian. I'll keep my part of the deal. Who better to keep a good man celibate than a flat-chested, homely, boring woman? I wouldn't put it quite like that, but you covered it pretty well. Thanks again, Brenda replied as she walked away to join her husband. Brenda wanted to talk last night before I left for work. Brain began at practice the next day. The point is that there are too many sexy single moms hanging around me. She believes that I would be much safer if I stayed close to you, Minx, or as she calls you, Gertrude. Why don't I feel safer? You are a smart person. You know that you will never be safe around a single woman, no matter how small her breasts are or how homely she looks, Gertrude jokes. Scamp, 
You are one of the most attractive women I have ever met, Brian answered sincerely. You are the whole set, not just silicone and bleach. Wow. You only made my job more difficult, Gertrude admitted, blushing. I'll make an appointment to have your eyes checked after baseball season ends. You'll find that I have 50-50 vision and am a great judge of people, with one glaring exception, Brian said. It seems I underestimated my loving wife. I think she may have underestimated us, Minx replied. That is if you really find me attractive. Brian was amused by the single mother's reactions as Minx remained by his side. He spent a lot of time with her, chatting and joking. The most common reaction was disbelief, followed by disappointment. It took the Minx less than one training session to eliminate him from the herd. The team's next game required a three-hour drive to Middleburg. It was decided that the team would travel the day before the game and spend the night in a hotel. It was hoped that the boys would be rested and fresh for their next challenge. Brian dropped off Jake Winston's parents as well as Minx. Discussion along the way focused on the team's chances of winning the district game and possibly the state title. They arrived at the hotel right behind the team bus. Brian helped Ralph Winston get his luggage out of the trunk. Some parents, including the Winstons, volunteered to accompany the boys and where to stay at the same hotel. All other parents had to book rooms in different hotels. With several games being played the next day, there were a lot of fans and players in the city. Six teams from different school grades will compete in three games. Before Tim boarded the bus, Brian told him that he would not be staying at the same hotel and had to behave himself in front of his coaches and chaperones. He assured his son that he would be at team practice the next morning. What hotel are you staying at, Minx? Brian asked as the Winstons wheeled their bags into the team hotel. In the same hotel as you, was her simple answer. I never told you what hotel I was staying at. How did you know? asked a puzzled Brian. I didn't know that, came the short answer. How do you know that we are in the same hotel? It's quite busy this weekend. You might not be able to get a room at the last minute, Brian noted. I'm sure something will come up, Gertrude replied with a wide smile, confusing Brian even more. Brian arrived at his hotel a few minutes later and asked Gertrude, Scamp, would you like to see if you can get a room while I check in? I can wait to make sure you find something. Thanks, but I'll just wait here. I'll be fine, she insisted. Brain finally began to see the light when he checked in and collected his room access cards. He returned to his truck to find Minx already waiting for him. Is there any chance you might want one of these cards for my room? He asked. This is room 207. What a caring gesture, Minx exclaimed, getting out of the car, taking the keys and kissing Brian on the cheek. Let's go to bed. It's going to be a long night. The next morning, Brian woke up much more tired than when he went to bed. At first, he mentally struggled with the reality of breaking his marriage vows, but Minx helped him deal with it. Let's look at this logically. Not only did Brenda cheat on you, but she agreed to distance herself from you sexually. Even if she didn't, she would still be putting your health at risk by having unprotected sex with her lover. Essentially, she made sexual relations with her unsafe and unwanted, she released you from your vows and marriage contract. I haven't had sex for more than two years. I've been tested, and I'm clear. You were tested after discovering she was a cheater, and you are in the clear. I've been taking the pills for over a month in hopes of sleeping with you. Can you honestly give me one reason why we shouldn't sleep together? Is it because of my appearance? Your wife thought I was the perfect front for all the busty, beautiful women who showed interest in you because she knew I would never be sexually attracted to you. Am I just unwanted? Minx, you are extremely desirable. Never say it's not true. I have never cheated on Brenda, and that requires some adjustment in my thinking, but you made a great case for us being together. I'm ready, Brian said with a grin. You need to know something else first answered Minx. Both my parents are in hospice care and are not expected to live long. My brother was sending Horace feature films to his friend. My friend is the baseball coach at the best prep school in Los Angeles. 
if Horace gets a baseball scholarship for next year, we'll probably move back. I really like you, but we don't expect a long-term relationship. This can't go on forever. Look at us. You're a handsome married man whose wife is cheating on you. I am a simple woman, and I have a son who has a chance to get a sports scholarship to a good university. I have to do what's best for Horace, she concluded. Nice to hear about Scooter, Brian said proudly. He's a good guy and a very talented baseball player. I'm glad he will have the chance to hone his skills in a highly competitive environment and at the same time receive a good education. You are the main reason why the best schools pay attention to him. I know how much time and work you devote to him. The irony is that you, by being such a good mentor to my son, actually gave us the opportunity to move back to Los Angeles, away from you. I don't think I'll have a one-night stand, Brian said. Perhaps it would be better to give up sex completely than to have a one-night stand and become a monk again. You are a stupid person. I said that we would probably return to Los Angeles for the next school year. There are more than six months left before that. A guy could spend a lot of time with me in six months unless he's too old for a steady diet of hot sex with a very needy woman. That's something we just need to find out. Will you live up to your nickname, Minx? Brian joked. I will do this for you, Minx promised. When you need me, just whistle and I will teach you to whistle. I've always been told that my whistling is quite respectable, Brian quipped. Then you're doing it wrong, Gertrude retorted. The baseball team won the state championship, and Scooter received a scholarship to a prestigious California prep school. Both of Gertrude's parents passed away just before Thanksgiving, within a week of each other. Brian and Tim attended their funeral. Brian met Gertrude's brother and immediately liked him. Brian, meet my brother Dexter. Gertrude introduced him. Dexter, this is Horace's baseball mentor and our good friend Brian. Holy shit, Brian exclaimed. Your name is Dexter? That's right, Gertrude's brother agreed. Only Gertrude and my parents ever called me Dexter. I respond to Grimm the same way as everyone else. What do you call my sister? I call her Scamp, but don't ask me why, Brian insisted. I don't think I need to ask. Grimm replied with a laugh. Brian spent Thanksgiving with Brenda and Tim at her parents' house. For the first time in months, Brian found himself preparing to go to bed with Brenda. They always stayed over for Thanksgiving night, and Brian couldn't think of a good excuse to change that tradition. Brenda was in no hurry to undress in front of Brian. Brenda was a very attractive woman with a beautiful toned body. We haven't slept together for a long time, Brenda cooed. You must already need love. Make love with me. Brian felt awkward about his next comment, even as he responded. Are you finally admitting that you need proper maintenance? I knew you would break. I will be glad to please you and give you a wide smile on your face for the holiday. You pathetic bastard. With that attitude, you won't get another round for many years. Brenda growled. What is wrong with you? You might just forget that I even thought about letting you touch me. Okay was Brian's only response as he rolled over so his back was facing Brenda. He didn't second-guess his comment, although it was out of character for him to do so. This actually achieved his goal, which was to avoid sex with Brenda. However, Brian did regret that his marriage had ended to its current state. Brenda was worried about Brian's snide remark, which was making it difficult for her to sleep. Lying next to him, she wondered if he knew about her affair or was just unhappy that they hadn't had sex lately. She decided that she would have to discuss this with Bill. He needed to forget about having sex with Brenda in her marital bed if she was having sex with Brian. This statement caused her to avoid and refuse her husband, which could ultimately make him suspicious. It could have ruined her marriage. Brian had a daily routine that he followed when he worked the night shift. He went home, ate a small breakfast, and went to bed by 9 a.m., Often he woke up around two o'clock in the afternoon from the fact that Minx climbed into his bed naked. They made love for an hour before she left, so she could be home when Scooter returned from school. Baseball is over for the season. This allowed Brian to shower and shave when Tim returned home from school. Brian often took a nap in the evening before leaving for work. Overall, things worked out well for Brian and Minx. One evening in early December, 
Brian received a call from Tim shortly after arriving at work. Dad, Scooter and I are hanging out with Heather and Holly in Heather's car. You said we might be gone until midnight because there's no school tomorrow. We have a problem. Heather was driving her mom's car. We had a flat tire and no spare tire in the trunk. We're stuck on D Street and I'm a little worried. I see a few guys down at the slot machines and they're looking in our direction. Are you broke on fucking D Street? At the damn arcade? Brian swore. We'll discuss this later. Is Heather driving that Corolla? Yes. It's a 2017 Corolla, Tim answered quickly. I'll find a wheel and tire that fits and I'll be right there. Keep your doors locked and call the police if you have any problems. Take care of these girls. Brian put his phone in his pocket and headed to the production floor. He quickly found the person he needed. Gus, you still drive that Corolla, don't you? Brian asked the bearded man operating the forklift. I need an inflated tire that fits your car, and I need it right now. While Brian was talking to Gus, another thought occurred to him as Jack Reynolds walked by. Jack was Holly's uncle. His younger sister was Holly's mother. Jack, my son and some friends were stuck on D Street with a flat tire and no spare. Holly is with them. I take the inflated tire from Gus and head there. I would appreciate it if you came with me. I have a real spare tire, not some fucking donut, Gus said. Let's take my car and go there right now. Jack, Gus, and Brian immediately headed towards the door leading to the parking lot. They were concerned about children being in that part of town late at night. It was not a good place for good children, especially teenage girls. Brenda lay in bed, enjoying the warmth she always felt after messing with Bill. His phone rang, and he glanced at the caller ID. Damn it! This is Heather! I have to answer this or she'll beat the crap out of me for ignoring her! Brenda could only hear one part of the conversation, but was concerned about what she overheard. What the hell are you kids doing there? Well, that's too bad. These boys are old enough to handle a little problem like this. Call AAA. It's not my fault your mother is too dumb not to keep a spare tire in her car. What was all this? Brenda asked as soon as Bill disconnected the connection. Nothing to worry about, was Bill's response as he reached out and caressed Brenda's firm breasts. Heather has a flat teary, but she calls AAA to get it fixed. Several young hoodlums were hanging around Heather's car when Brian and his friends pulled up right behind her. Brian quickly got out of the car and pulled the jack and tire iron out of Gus's trunk. Gus brought the spare tire and Jack knocked on the driver's side window and motioned for Heather to lower it so he could talk to her. You guys sit quietly until we change the tire. If these idiots cause any trouble, we'll take care of it. Holly, you're going to have to explain to your mother why you're even here on D Street. Brian carried the jack behind the flat rear tire and slid it under the frame. He twisted it until it was snug against the frame, then moved in front of the tire to loosen the lug nuts. The apparent leader of the group of tough guys approached Jack while Brian was working on the tire. Here you are on our territory. You need my permission before you mess with this machine. Before Jack could respond, Brian swung the pry bar sharply and cracked the guy on both shins. The man fell to his knees and then rolled on the ground, rubbing his shins and cursing the blue streak. Brian grabbed the punk by the collar and pulled him face down to lie next to the flat tire. He then sat on the man's back and continued unscrewing the nuts. The two closest gang members rushed towards them, apparently intent on pulling Brian away from their incapacitated leader. Jack hit the first one on the side of the head, and he collapsed, as if knocked down. As Gus stepped forward, the second guy stepped back out of his reach. Lift the car a little and I'll remove this tire, Brian said to Jack in a calm voice. Jack continued to drive the car higher and higher while the gang of thugs shouted insults and curses at the men. Every now and then, the guy underneath Brian would try to squirm out from under him, but Brian would grab the man by the greasy hair, lift his head a few inches, and forcefully push it back down to the pavement. It only took two lessons before the man on the ground decided to remain still. Brian unscrewed the lug nuts and removed the flat cover. He accepted the working tire from Gus and put it in place. Once he had all the tabs snug, Jack lowered the car. All three men seemed oblivious to the thugs who taunted them as they worked. Brian tightened the nuts and stood up. He 
accidentally kicked the leader in the balls when he was about to step over him. Are you stupid bastards talking to us? Brian asked, walking up to the assembled gang members and casually tossing the tire iron from hand to hand. As soon as he walked towards them, the group scattered. You guys get the hell out of here, Jack instructed as Brian pushed the gang away from the car. Be careful not to run over those stupid bastards lying in the street and stay away from this part of town. The three men climbed back into Gus's car and followed Heather's car as it reached the next intersection and turned toward the children's house. I can't believe you hit that stupid bastard in the shin like that, Gus laughed. He collapsed like a sack of shit. Thank you for inviting me along, Jack added. My arm hurts, but it was great to hit that punk in the head. So you were sitting on your butt while you changed the tire. Gus chuckled. It was funny to watch. The men were still laughing and talking about their experiences as they walked back to their jobs. By morning, this story had spread throughout the plant. Stories of courage and adventure have always been popular, especially during the night shift. They helped the night go by faster and gave everyone a chance to take their mind off how tired or sleepy they felt. The next day when Brian woke up, Minx jumped into his bed and kissed him long and hard. She was naked and clearly hungry for him. Horace told me what happened last night. You were great. Thank you for taking such good care of the children, Scamp blurted out. You're about to be so lucky. I would have arrived earlier, but I had to wait until Horace and Tim went to visit the girls since they didn't have school today. Brenda had only been at work an hour when Sue Blaine approached her at the water cooler. It was obvious that she wanted to talk about something. I heard Brian, Jack Reynolds, and Gus Benson make fun of a few would-be tough guys who were hanging around the kid's car on D Street. I understand that getting hit in the shins with a tire iron knocks the crap out of a punk pretty quickly. Brenda immediately put it all together. Last night, Heather called her father seeking help, but he brushed her off. Apparently, her problem was bigger than Bill was admitting. Sue used the word children, so that probably meant Holly was involved along with Horace and her son Tim. I'm curious what you heard, Brenda replied. I would like to see if the rumors are close to the truth. By the time Sue finished telling her what the rumor mill was spreading, Brenda was furious with Bill Grant, although she hid the fact from Sue. His daughter turned to him for help in a situation that could have turned into a disaster, and Bill simply brushed off her concerns. Brian, along with Gus and Holly's Uncle Jack, reacted as men should. They protected the children and helped them get out of a difficult situation. Bill ignored his daughter's plight in favor of sex with Brenda. The realization that she had sex with a man who refused to help his own daughter and some of her friends, including Tim, hurt her deeply. How low has she fallen? Brian was ten times better than Bill. The sad thing was that Brenda knew this from the very beginning. Why did she even get involved with this selfish, pompous ass? Early that morning, Brenda found Bill alone in the break room, enjoying a snack while his delivery truck was being serviced. She wasted no time in pouncing on him. Heather came to you for help last night and you blew her off. These kids could be in great danger, and yet you told her to call Triple H. What kind of father are you? Everything worked out. Bill answered briskly. Your husband and a few of his buddies saved the day, so what's the problem? Brian reacted like a real man. You turned your back on your daughter. That's the problem. My son was in that car. If your dumbass husband is so special, why are you having fun with me when he hasn't touched you in months? Bill asked with a chuckle. You pathetic bastard! Being a man has nothing to do with you! Brenda spat. He's more of a man than you'll ever be. It's all over between us. Don't ever try to talk to me again. I don't want anything to do with you. As you say, was Bill's calm answer. There are many married women in the world who are looking for someone like me. If you change your mind, you know where to find me. I'll still give you pleasure if you ask nicely. Brenda burst into tears and ran out of the room. She cheated on her husband, disrespected him, and risked her marriage and family for a petty, selfish sociopath. She only hoped that Brian would never find out how stupid she had been. With that thought, she realized she had a lot of catching up to do. The Minx had just finished with Brian when she heard sniffling behind her. Surprised, Minx turned around to find Brenda watching her with tears streaming down her cheeks. How could you do this to me? Brenda exclaimed. I trusted you both, 
and you do this? I'm just doing as you asked, Minx replied, reaching for her clothes and starting to put them on after she pressed a finger to Brian's lips, ordering him to remain silent. You wanted me to keep those busty blondes from getting their claws into Brian? I sacrificed my body to achieve your goals. I didn't want you to sleep with him and you know it, Brenda replied as her anger began to crowd out her tears. I can't believe Brian could cheat on me like that, especially with some skinny bitch. I know it's hard to stomach the fact that Brian and I are dealing with freaks, but there's no reason to be insulted, Minx reasoned. Your poor husband was ready to explode. I'm just helping to relieve the pressure he put on me. Bill Grant didn't want you to have sex with your husband, so Brian had to turn to someone. Luckily, I was in the right place at the right time. You can thank me for helping you turn off Brian so completely and make Bill happy. By the way, where is Bill? Is he in your bed? Do you know about Bill? Brenda exclaimed. Well, yes, answered Minx. I think most of the free world knows about Bill. You've been sleeping with him for months now. He promised you that he would have sex with you in your marital bed every time you had sex with Brian, so you stopped having sex with your own husband. Luckily, Bill was able to fill the void. The pun is intentional. If Brian knew, why didn't he say anything? Why did he let Bill and I be together for so long? Brenda asked, tears streaming down her cheeks. You are a smart girl. What would most men do if they discovered their wife was cheating? He would get very angry and yell at me. Then he probably would have divorced me, Brenda added, as the reality of the situation became clearer. It sounds something like this. What happens next? Can Brian and Tim stay here while you move in with Bill? Minx asked calmly. I wouldn't move out of my house. I wouldn't mind Tim either. If Brian wanted a divorce, he would have to move out. He would pay alimony and child support. Tim would have stayed with me, Brenda concluded. Exactly what Brian expected, Minx agreed. Let's say that staying close to Tim and being the best father he could be was his first goal. How could he achieve this goal? Because he won't divorce me, Brenda answered quietly. He stayed here for Tim, not for me. He found out about Bill and me and essentially divorced me, just not legally. We've been living as a divorced couple for months now, haven't we? I was just too damn stupid to realize it. In your defense, I can say that Bill helped you not to notice that your husband left emotionally long ago. I'm just a skinny bitch who showed up after you ruined everything. I helped Brian recover. I told Bill it was over between us. I never want to see him again, Brenda said. Was this after he refused to help his daughter out of a sticky situation last night? You didn't have much choice, did you? Minx asked rhetorically. Even traders have some expectations and some restrictions. Are you and Brian going to live together now? Brenda asked, wiping the remaining tears from her eyes. To be honest, we are quite happy with what we have. Horace and I will return to Los Angeles before school starts in the fall, admitted Scamp. I'd rather he didn't know his mom was having fun with his best friend's dad, if there's anything to be done about it. When it's time for me to leave, I'll probably help Brian choose a new girlfriend, if he'll let me. So, you see, I didn't steal your husband like other mothers hoped to do. We temporarily enjoy each other's company, much the same way you did with the asshole. What if I don't let this continue? He is my husband. You have no right to sleep with him, Brenda insisted. You gave me this right as soon as you gave yourself to Bill Grant, answered the minx. It pretty much freed Brian from any obligations he might have had towards you. He and I are exceptional people. We can trust each other, if you can imagine that. I told Brian that he couldn't have sex with you or anyone else if he wanted me around, Minx added. Who knows who else Bill Grant slept with or what diseases he might have had. Brenda began to cry again as she considered the statement of the woman she knew as Gertrude. Could Bill have had sex with someone else on the side? Of course he could. Brenda no longer had any illusions about the kind of man Bill Grant was. She needed to get tested ASAP. And what will happen now? Brenda asked fearfully. Let's just continue like this. I'll stop by and wake Brian up as often as I can. You continue to work late and avoid him as much as possible. I think this will work just fine. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, answered Minx. I'm not going to do this, Brenda said categorically. You're leaving in a few months. 
I'm going to stay here and show Brian what a great wife I can be. He won't need your skinny ass. Except he knows that my skinny ass is loyal to him, while your round ass is out there somewhere, waiting to be patted by whoever, Minx retorted. Basically, I control your sex life, or at least your sex life with Brian. I won't let him get close to you as long as we're in a relationship. I don't want to risk getting sick, and he doesn't really want it either. One thing I learned, a little too late, is that relationships are about so much more than sex, Brenda said with false bravado. Actually, sex without love or commitment is actually quite humiliating. I will do what a wife should happily do for her husband, while you just have sex with him. Think about it. Okay, answered Minx. I thought about that. Let's do it. You cook the guy great lasagna and meatloaf, keep the toilets clean and wash his clothes. I will entertain him in bed as often as I can. Let's see which of us is happier. Brian, I have to tell you how ashamed I am and how sorry I am for disrespecting you. Can you ever forgive me? Brenda pleaded. How could he ever trust you again? Asked Minx. He might forgive you someday, but how the hell are you going to win back his trust? This has always been the obstacle that traitors face. I suggest you try to enjoy the next few months while you're still Brian's wife, at least in name. Realize what you sacrificed for mediocre sex and learn from it. Brian doesn't want to destroy his family while Tim is in school. That will give you about nine months after I leave to do everything possible to get him back. When Tim graduates, Brian will probably kick your ass to the curb, Scamp predicted. Brian, why do you let her speak for you? asked Brenda. I'm not just his mistress. I'm his best friend, answered Minx. While you were whispering sweet nothings in Bill's ear, Brian and I were having our own conversation in bed. I promised to deal with this particular situation if and when it finally arises. He promised to thank me as soon as I did this. Could you leave us alone now? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.